Here we go. Well, greetings, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, to our continuing series on both sport, health, business. I'll just call it prosperity across any area and stuff. I want to uh, introduce you to Tom Chorney. Now, just to give you some background, none of these uh, interviews are scripted. They're not planned from the standpoint of what we're really going to say or go on. Tom and I touched base for the first time in probably a year or two mm -hmm. on a Saturday just to set up a time to do this. And just the way we're going to do it here on this, on StreamYard, direct to Facebook, which is great. That, I, I that's do. correct. The, none of this is scripted. <laughs> Excellent. Did that come off? Right? <laughs> yeah, that came off really good. Yeah, it's smooth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you do uh, pop on here, let us know where you're from, what you're doing. If you got any questions or comments, feel free to um, to ask. If they scroll through too quick, I'll ask you to post them up again later, towards the end of this. But just as an introduction of Tom, Tom and I met each other approximately ten years ago, maybe twelve years ago at uh, USANA Health Sciences uh, International Convention in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I was somewhat familiar with the name because I do follow track a fair bit. And uh, something I'm just gonna disclose to Tom right now, he didn't know. Tom, I sort of started a movement out of my little town of Elora, Ontario, of some very gifted athletes in track and field. And one of them, I think you uh, competed against, a guy by the name of Matt Kerr. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, I think he's at uh, Boston, I think, uh, coaching right now or something. Yeah, Very true. But uh, I was on the cohort of the 70s, so that doesn't even count anymore. But, That's when uh, I was born. Yeah, okay, uh, when you were born. So you were a baby, and I was sweating on the track. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> but he, uh, Tom was really, uh, I just call it studly, coming out of high school. He went to uh, Indiana. He's a Hoosier. Uh, so track like uh, when me out in Nebraska, football rained heavily in, in Indiana. I know that basketball rains have heavily. So you fight for the attention, right, of the, yes. of the deal that, that way. But uh, what's really cool in that, and for my Canadian friends to understand, what he accomplished there is absolutely amazing. He was multiple-time All-American. And that is saying something. Was that in two sports, Tom? Was that in track and cross country? or That is correct, yes. Okay, yeah, on that time. So upon graduating out of there, he uh, he decided to keep his track career going kind of a full tilt and went pro. Mm -hmm. And um, pro. I think that was probably about the time you ran into USANA, probably yeah. right about then, right? Uh, almost uh, the exact same time. Yeah, At that time. Yep. And then in 2001, you became the American steeplechase champion. Yes. And if people aren't familiar with steeplechase, let me tell you, that is one heck of a horse race and stuff. In fact, I thought I was studly in, in steeplechase. Now, this was back again, yeah, like, like 70s. <laughs> but then I looked at his time, and I looked at mine, and I said, my God, he'd be going across the finish line, and I've just come off of the, the curve coming into the home stretch. So <laughs> that's like a long way away. So that's great. But Tom... <laughs> Yeah, you even took it another step beyond that because after that and realizing things are winding down and probably you're not going to be as fast in the future as you were probably in the past. It's a hard transition that we make in athletics. Yeah. You decided to keep and take that passion that you had and transform that into coaching. And yes. I know you did some volunteer coaching, right, at, at your alma mater? Is that yeah, I was, I was at Indiana ultimately for six years of volunteer coaching. Uh, worked very well with me finishing up my professional career and not necessarily quite transitioning into the, the working world, but I did manage a shoe store. And I, so I worked with some community runners as well um, and got to be very familiar with the shoe industry and uh, marketing a store. We actually created uh, a very posh uh, running store at the time as well. So I got some pretty good experience, uh, both coaching and in the working world. Um, yeah. Actually pretty enjoyable. 
Yeah, which actually is odd oftentimes. We see so many athletes, unfortunately, get so narrow that yeah. when they leave that arena, they're oftentimes lost. Yes. I mean, and, and that's the thing. Yeah, I, but, I've uh, experienced that myself. I, it was, uh, I guess, dealing with not accomplishing some of the goals that I had had. Uh, it, that's a very difficult thing. It's, in fact, what a lot of our current seniors are dealing with now. You know, they didn't have, they didn't even have the chance to not achieve their goals. <laughs> you know, they, it was just taken right out from under them, unfortunately. Yeah, which is something we should actually touch on now. Yeah. I mean, big time. One of the things certainly is as a coach now and as a head coach, you've, you've really taken a program and taken it up a couple of notches. And you've been at your current university for how long now? So this is year five. It's the fourth year as a head coach. Fourth year head coach, right? Track, and track. Division one, cross country, track, men's, and yeah. women's. And we women. 100 yeah. athletes. And the, the, the thing about that is you come to realize that you take kind of the future of young men and women, you know, into your hands from a standpoint of guidance and mentoring, right? Yes. So sometimes that's a lot of things off of the track as well, too. Unfortunately, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know say I don't know how much you want me to comment on that specifically but it, it it really is it's becoming one of these things where we have to know how to talk to them uh, from a psychological standpoint uh, we need to know first and foremost who to refer them to if there are issues or if there's troubles or if they do need to talk to somebody or if medically they need to see somebody uh, it's a lot different now than it used to be when I was in college mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure much different then from what it was 10 years previous um, where, you know, the coaches don't just take care of everything. Um, you know, the, you have to be very careful about your interaction with the athletes, um, not only from a, uh, a rule standpoint, but also from just a liability standpoint. You know, there's rules for everything, and they yeah. change all the time, and so we have to keep up on that. Yeah, we had a real unfortunate incident here with <clears throat> actually uh, a coach that I'm very familiar with and my brothers were very familiar with at a – premier uh, university uh, in Ontario who, you know, it's unfortunate, but really crossed the line. Yeah. And put a big stain on uh, the track community up, up here. But then suddenly out of the blue comes this thing that everybody's dealing with. Yeah. Which is this Corona slash COVID. Yes. And you had young men and young women that were looking forward. This is their fourth year. They're getting ready to graduate. This is their okay. What can I do? What am I really going to accomplish? And all of that came to a screaming halt on them, like yeah. that, right? Yeah, we were. I was in Albuquerque, um, March eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth. This was when the uh, the NBA decided to uh, postpone or suspend the season, and um, we were there for the NCAA championships for indoor track and field. Uh, I had one male athlete that had qualified. He'd run. Uh, 148, 53 or 148, 43 to, to qualify. Uh -huh. He was in shape to go run 147 flat, maybe break 147 for the first time. And that could have given him a top three spot, a top three finish at the national meet. Um, and we were the day before the competition and, you know, things have been escalating. We're getting updates every three or four hours while we're there. And you could just feel this heaviness start to kind of sink in and, the day before we were, we were at the track to pre-meet his race was the following day. And we talked to the university of New Mexico coach who actually happened to coach at Miami previously. Um, and he told us that the, the big 10 had just pulled their athletes from the meet. And up to that point, it was only the Harvard athletes that were not being allowed to compete. And so we thought, you know, maybe this is going to progress. Maybe it's not. But as soon as we heard that, we knew that they were going to cancel the whole thing. They'd already at that point said no spectators in the stands and they were going to go on with the meet. But then as soon as that happened, it was just over. So um, it literally pulled right out from underneath us. Um, in fact, we had to change our flights and they wanted everybody to go home as soon as they could. So it, it was wow. a very, very it, it was again, we talk about uncertainty, especially on March 13th. Um, there was a little bit of fear uh, driven. I don't know how you could have, uh, I guess, without being 
I don't want to say ignorant, but without thinking that this was just being blown way out of proportion, there, I think everybody was walking around with a little bit of fear, not sure exactly what was going to happen. So, um, and I can tell you, it didn't even dawn on me. I, I was so acutely aware of this, this athlete losing his chance to compete at the national meet that I didn't even think about the other team until I saw an Instagram post of one of my seniors who had cracked his kneecap the summer before and, and was on the long road to recovery and was really getting excited for the outdoor season. It was his last chance to compete and score at the conference meet and uh, qualify for the national meet. And he, uh, he posted about how devastated he was and it was just torn right out from on, under him. And I, I actually, uh, this was the night before we still, we flew back home and I, uh, I just, I was in my hotel room and I cried. I just, I sat there and I, I cried and was just devastated for hours trying to figure out how I was going to have these conversations with these athletes. I mean, wow. it, was, it was low. I just was definitely, it was an emotional time um, realizing what we had just lost um, just because every single individual kid, that's such a huge story. Um, no matter if, you know, again, working with the community runners at the running store, I realized how important an individual's goals are, you know, who cares if it's an Olympic stage or if it's the uh, it's just, I want to lose 15 pounds because I'll feel better about myself. Yep. Who cares what the goal is and what the stage is? The, the goals that somebody have has uh, and has set for themselves and the purpose that they've defined for their life, if, if that's pulled out from under them, it's just, it's devastating. So that was a real acute uh, lesson that I had learned there. Wow. And and now, now you look at basically the next season, everything's going to be up in the air as well too. You know, you've yeah. got rules and regulations you have to abide by and respect that <coughs> NCAA and funding and scholarships and, and not only trying to take care of some of the folks that maybe want to come back for their fourth year as fifth year seniors or graduate students, but how do you recruit into your freshman class? Right. How, right. Do, you, how do you do that? Where's the money? Where's the numbers? Where are the pieces? You don't know, yeah. do you? You don't well, it, we don't yet. It's something we're still figuring out. I think it, there's a, a mix of information out there from, you know, the the NCAA has given an extra year of eligibility automatically to uh, to all spring sports. So it's not any it's it's an automatic waiver. You don't have to like actually fill any paperwork out. It's just automatically there. Um, they've also allowed anybody on scholarship can return on the same scholarship or up to the same amount of scholarship. Mm -hmm. we reduce it if we want. Um, but as soon as we go above what they were currently on and, you know, in our sport, it, it's partial scholarships. It's rare to be on a full scholarship. Um, and so if we want to go above and beyond what they were on this year, then it, the whole thing has to count towards our limits. So the NCAA has a limit for our, each program. You know, we have 18 women scholarship and they allow 12.6 for the men in terms of track and field. Um, and so then we have to figure out, well, what is the university willing to do and what are they, what are they able to do? And, and in addition, you know, we've got, we do have athletes. We have five athletes that are trying to return. One of them was already in a fifth year. So she might be trying to come, trying to come back for a sixth year, <laughs> um, but she's an all American level javelin thrower, mm -hmm. American level 400 meter run, um, runner. And, you know, they are very valuable to us if they can make it work, but you know, do they have to give up on grad school? Have they had a job offer that they now need to say, Hey, would you delay my offer for a year? And those are real conversations that are happening right now. Well, I'm sure you're having those and you're having them with uh, the best <laughs> intent for yeah. the, for the athlete, for yeah. the athlete, right? That's yeah. We, I mean, we had 22 seniors uh, between men's and women's team and for some of them, it was time to go. Uh, it was just like, you know, we've, we've dealt with injuries, you know, some, some bodies just don't hold up. Um, to the stress of both academics and athletics at the division one level. And uh, for some of them, it was time. And I think everybody made the right decision. I don't think I had anybody that wanted to come back that, that I felt differently about. I, th I think it's, it's all as it should be. Yeah. Well, it's like Bettina says here. I know Bettina, she's actually lives on the shores of Lake Ontario <clears throat> there. Um, almost smack dab across from Rochester. But she just relates with that. She just looks at that from the standpoint of the hopes and dreams and such of that time. But you know, one great thing about sport, and I will say that, is that <clears throat> sport can teach you to be so resilient. Yeah. It isn't funny, right? That yeah. you know that the vast majority of the 
benefit that you get from sport it has nothing to do with the competition, but it has everything to do with the with yeah. the day to day, the training, the discipline, the, the ups and the downs, the camaraderie, right? And yeah. and most importantly, oftentimes the sharing. Yeah. Your, your seniors probably end up passing a lot of great information onto those freshmen coming in. Yeah. That way, and that, and that's a reflection of the coaching staff. But anyways. Let's get back. Let's get back though to a little bit about performance. I mean, okay. you have ended up, you've ended up creating, and I call it creating, mentoring through coaching, being a guide to several athletes to attain all American status yes. over the last few, right? Kind of like where you came from, right? And yeah. you'll continue to I, do that. I mean, I was I was very lucky at Indiana. Um, the head coach there is uh, Ron Helmer. He's been there since two thousand seven now. And he's a fantastic coach. He's done amazing things with that program. And so I learned a lot just by observing. But uh, from day one, he asked, you know, I was a steeplechaser by trade. So he said, do you think you can handle the steeplechasers? I said, yes. And in the six years I was there, he 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 dropped in on a steeple-specific session. Like I, were, I did the technical work. Um, he still coached the overall athlete. But um, he, he stopped in maybe two or three different times. And I think he saw that I knew what I wanted to see and I knew what I was doing. And uh, during that time, I know the, the best year that we had, we had uh, four of the top 10 steeplechasers in the NCAA. They, they ran for the men, they ran 835, 836, 840, 842, all in the same year. And that was, uh, that was fantastic. I mean, the, yeah. all of them scored wow. at the meet. and it was, and one of them went on to make the world championship team the first year out of college um, Deshaun Turner, and he's actually my assistant coach here at Miami University now. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. He, I knew I always wanted him as an assistant coach, and it's we have an amazing staff here, so I love it. Um, but then on the women's side, I also coached uh, Sarah Pease was my fastest, who went on to run 940 in the steeplechase, and she uh, she just made her first U.S. team this past year, so she's still competing, um, but she was an Olympic trials qualifier. So I've coached uh, a handful of them on to Olympic trials and U S championship level. Um, I probably five or six different top 10 finishes at the U S championships. Wow. 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 It's been fun. Well, let's back up all the way to that transition that you made. So coming out of college at a university, you're saying I'm going pro. Um, yeah. And you knew that there had to be, obviously the science was changing. You know, during that period of time, we learned a lot during their early 90s from the mistakes that were made in the 80s by so many athletes, right? Yeah. And as you and I have talked multiple times in the past, in the far distance past, you know, this, I call it this this poison atmosphere a little bit of performance over health is a problem in athletics. Yeah. You know, we've seen the recent controversies from the Soviet Union obviously with their steroid, you know, they're just yeah, drug issue, EPO, you know, th those sorts of things going on. We know the ramifications early on of, of people, I call it the experimental stage that today they're walking around with, with joint issues that will never recover yep. because they use, you know, they use, let's just call it cortisone or corticoid derivatives, right. To yep. deaden the pain of, joints and things and degraded the tendons and ligaments right yeah um we know other, other folks we won't bring up but pretty famous folks that uh, today are walking around with less than 100 percent lung capacity because they used um uh substances to help them recover quicker between workouts so you you had to be looking at that you're a clean athlete mm -hmm you know, ultra clean athlete, you had to say that. And you said, how can I up my game? So yeah. tell me, how do you become the national champion coming out of university? Yeah, you get a little bit stronger as you get a little bit older. I know. That. <laughs> but the question is, is you, you go and you have some real breakthroughs. Yeah. So maybe you could share that with us. Sure. I mean, I, th I think the, the ultimate thing to realize is that I came into – as a child with the work ethic to kind of see it through to the end, whatever it was, I was going to work hard. 
Um, I was going to be the best that I could be at no matter what I do, you know, sporting or outside of sporting world. And um, I think that that definitely drove me to have the early success that I had uh, as four time state champ in high school, uh, made the Foot Locker national meet in cross country. And, and I think that along the way, I, I discovered there were new levels. And mm -hmm. so it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe that's where I should be going next. And, and I think every time I went to a new stage and I got beat by somebody, I thought, well, next year, I'm going to be the one that is doing the beating. You know, I, I always had a progressive outlook on, on the goals that I set for myself. So part of that was just uh, innate to me. And I don't know where it really came from. I think probably a lot of the way my dad drove me to be thorough and to, to see things through. Um, ironically, there's things in my life I don't see through as well as I did with my running career. <laughs> but um, I think that the decision to, to want to be great was, was where it started. Now, I set that up in the way that I did because there was also uh, there were also a lot of obstacles that got in the way, you know, no pun intended with the steeplechase, but I had a lot of like, things that were keeping me from being as good as I could be. I mean, you mentioned uh, Matt Kerr and uh, wait, Josh Kerr. I know a Josh Kerr and a Matt Kerr. Matt Kerr from he ran at Arkansas. He's Canadian, and that was, was the NCAA champion in 1999. And he shouldn't have been, I can tell you that I think that I should have been, but he was a fantastic runner. So I don't want to take that away, but um, we, we raced at a little bit of altitude in Boise state uh, and, and I'm severely affected by altitude when I'm at altitude. That's my excuse. But two weeks later I went to the U S championships and I ran eight thirty in the steeple, which was the fastest steeplechase time um, that year by a collegian. Um, including, including Matt, I think I'd maybe tied what he ran. So um, it was, it was one of these things where um, even running that 830, I knew that that was not going to get me uh, on an Olympic team. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't gonna, it wasn't going to get me to a U.S. championship uh, gold medal. And so um, when I graduated, uh, oh. I, what's that? Sorry. No, we just broke up for a minute. That's all. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> when I when I graduated college, I was faced with the decision of do I go work in the oil fields with my geology degree, or do I run professionally for Nike um, for a four thousand dollar a year contract and some travel money, and so that was my decision that I had to make. Um, being as passionate as I was about running, it was an easy decision. It's like I get to run for Nike; they're going to pay me four thousand dollars annually. <laughs> so it was, a, it was an easy decision, but it also put me in this position where I needed to figure out how I was going to make up the difference. Mm -hmm. um, how, how was I going to pay for the additional travel beyond what Nike was going to cover? And um, at the time, you know, I, I remember it, it had been a couple of years, my family had been telling me about USANA and it was, oh, Tommy, you're an athlete this USANA would be so good for you. Oh, you'd be so good at the business. And it was, uh, it was one of these things that went one in ear and out the other ear because, you know, I'm looking at myself like I am fit, I'm in shape, I can go beat anybody. And so to me, that meant that I was healthy. It would bounce off cars if they hit you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Or I'd just hurdle them. And uh, it was, uh, <laughs> but it was one of these things where I, I was, in my mind, I was healthy and you can, I've got my running logs and you can look back week after week after week. There was you know, a day or two off because I, I was sick or run down. Um, without fail, every single year, there was a time that I got sick for two or three weeks at a time. And I would try to run through it at first, but then I'd be forced to take time off. And then my recovery process was another week or two just to get back on track. And, the, and, my, and I was riddled with that. I mean, my entire life from middle school all the way on up, I just, I was sick all the time. And when... <laughs> So that was one of the obstacles. What, what, where USANA came in was the idea that I thought that I was healthy, even being as sick as I was, because that was just normal for me. I thought that everybody got sick that way. Um, my sister, Lisa, she called me one day and said, get out a piece of paper and a pen. I said, why? She's like, just do it. So as sisters are. So I did. And she, she brought me through uh, over the phone, it was a script that she was following to explain the compensation plan with the business that USANA offers, the home-based business, network marketing, which I was blown away. I mean, I'm, I'm a very smart numbers, science-y guy, and the numbers that she was showing me 
they blew me away. And I was enthralled at the end of that conversation. I said, sign me up because I wanted to do this business. I saw a way that I could support myself as a runner and fill in the gaps where I needed. And I was going to earn uh, the, the amount that I would earn was going to be based on what the effort that I put in, the, the amount of willingness to learn that I was going to put into that business. And so I had a couple friends that were, uh, that I was living with in Bloomington, Indiana. And for a couple months, I started to learn the business and tried to sell the product. And one of my friends at one point said, <laughs> how do you expect anybody to take your product if you're not even taking it yourself? Because I didn't, I didn't take the product. I didn't believe in supplements. Like I was healthy. I was fit. <laughs> you know, I'm getting the flu and getting sick all the time. Um, so it was one of those things where I, I had no argument and you can't argue that. And so I said, okay, uh, I guess I'll try, or I'll start taking the product, even though I did not believe in them at all. And uh, it was one of these things where I just signed my contract with Nike. I had just filled out my paperwork for the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, who can show up at my door and drug test me at any time that they want. They, in fact, they showed up early mornings, knock, knock, knock. Hi, my name's Ari from the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. You know, I had a roommate who answered the door once and didn't really know the extent of my running. And she's just like, okay, um, hold on a second. And she had to go get me at six in the morning. So, um, so I was, uh, I started taking the product and I was heavily training. This was in the year 2000. And uh, I had the Olympic trials coming up in June that year. And I started taking the product sometime in April mm -hmm. and, uh, the very first week that I took the product, I was on, I took the uh, essentials, which is the multivitamin. I took the proflavanol, which is the grapeseed extract. Just that, that's what I started with. I did one of the hardest workouts to date that I'd ever done in my life. And it was four by 4K. So four by two and a half miles with minutes rest in between. And I was running at about 440 mile pace. And this was on a, a nice hilly road. So two and a half miles at 440 pace, two minutes rest. And I was doing that over and over again. Um, I, I worked my butt off in that workout and I kept taking my vitamins that first week. Um, I recovered so quickly from that workout to the point that it was, it was significant enough that it was different. And it was, it wasn't just like, Hmm, I wonder if I am feeling anything. It was, Hey, I'm feeling something very different. I wonder why that is. Now my diet was very, very uh, let's just call it a college diet, a, a bachelor male college diet. Um, I did not change my diet at that point. I just started taking the supplements and I freaked out. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm thinking, holy crap, I'm going to test positive for something. I'm going to lose my contract and my, I'm going to be on a two year ban and I've got the Olympic trials coming up. And I was really freaking out. I stopped taking the product immediately. Um, and I, because I didn't know anything about the supplements, I didn't know anything about USANA besides the compensation plan at that time. I mean, I had heard the words pharmaceutical grade and potency guaranteed. And I, and I was like, okay, but I looked at the label and I, I compared every single ingredient to the, the list that USADA, the, the anti-doping agency and the NCAA and the, the U S Olympic committee, they all put out a list and nothing on the list, uh, was on the, on the label of the bottle. And so, then I learned what it meant to be pharmaceutical grade. And that at the time, I think there were only five companies worldwide that were pharmaceutical grade products. Um, and so I, I decided to continue taking the product. Well, try not to be too long on this. Uh, one of the things I do want to point out is I liked the business. I liked the product and I wanted to promote it because I liked what I was feeling. I, I called at least 28 different companies uh, different products to try to talk to somebody at their corporate headquarters. Can I talk to a scientist on staff? Um, a lot of times the answer was like, Oh, well, we don't have scientists. Um, well, who, de who designed your product? It's like, well, I'm not allowed to answer that, that question. Well, is there anybody there that can answer questions for an athlete? And they're like, no, I'm sorry. Like, I can pass on your, your question if you'd like. And so I would say, well, I'm a professional athlete. I'm subject to randomized drug testing. And I want to know that if I take your product, will you guarantee that I won't test positive from any banned substances? There were no companies that could do that. USANA was the only one. In fact, later, this was still before their, their elite athlete guarantee, but USANA became the first company, and I don't know if they're still the only one, that 
offered that elite athlete guarantee. As you won't. Oh, they are. Yeah, as far as I know, too. But they said you won't test positive for a banned substance because of our product. <clears throat> so I um, and it was a one million dollar elite elite athlete guarantee that they would back that up with. So it was uh, it gave me the peace of mind to continue. But a lot of times I was making those phone calls for other people that were like, "Well, I take this product." I was like, "Oh, let's let's call the number on the bottle." Yeah, and it was it was very eye opening to them. So back to the running. Um, that year in 2000, I remember with what I thought was two and a half laps to go in the Olympic trials, I took the lead uh, of a second chase group. There were two guys out in front, sorry, Mark Krogan, Pascal Dobert, and they were out front. They were going to make the Olympic team, but there was a big gap. And then I took third place. So, I'm, so I moved into third place, that third spot that makes the team thinking like, okay, I'm going to come around. There's going to be two laps to go. I'm feeling really good. I come around, there was three and a half laps to go. And something in my head was just like, wait a second, <laughs> somebody added a lap. I don't know what just happened. And I, I kind of freaked out there a little bit. Um, I lost my cool. Um, I started to panic a little bit. I thought maybe I made my move too soon. And from that point on, I just kind of clammed up and it, it, I ended up 10th place at the Olympic trials. I was seven and a half seconds away from making the Olympic team. Um, but it, it was a really big eye opener to me that I was ready to run as fast as the guys that made the Olympic team. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it that year. The following year you had mentioned, so 2001, uh, that's when my, my training level increased, mm -hmm. was more consistent. And I was able to run 80, 90 miles a week, which that was, that was my high, um, at the time was 80, 90 miles a week, but I was consistently training all the way through the entire year and ultimately stepped out on the track and won the U S championship in 2001, where I made the world championship team. I made the goodwill games. Um, and when I look back at my training, the year 2000 and 2001, those were the first and only years of my life that I did not get sick once. Wow. Uh, is that right? And that was, I mean, I, again, I've got the logs to compare. Um, there was not one day missed because I was sick when I, from the day that I started taking those products, um, it was, it was transformational. Um, along the way, my, my diet did change, but it was only because I had read a book called Bionutrition, mm -hmm. Ray Strand, who was a long time, uh, associate with, uh, USANA. And, uh, that book is still one I recommend today because he puts it in great terminology. Um, what antioxidants are, what's free, the relationship to free radicals and how that basically compromises your immune system. And I learned so much from Dr. Strand along the years through even just private conversations that uh, uh, the immune system and nutrition are uh, one in the same. And uh, that's why I was uh, able to up the level of my, my training and, and it really carried forth to a new level. It, it sounds like so many athletes that I've <clears throat> worked with in the past. It's just, yeah. You know, I always sum it up. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to recover quicker between workouts, period. Right? Really? Yeah, really. Right? Yeah. You're going to have less injury, which I think has everything to do with biomechanics because they've required, yeah. they've recovered better. Yeah. Um, you're going to be less ill. You might yeah. feel the sniffles come on and then they're going to disappear. Where in the past you got them and you had them full blast. Yeah. And... And here's the thing, and you're going to start thinking a little bit sharper. You're going to have a little bit higher cognition, unlike missing, losing a lap. <laughs> yeah. We've all done it. We've all done it. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, it was it was an embarrassing mistake that nobody really knows until I tell them. So, well, now now a whole bunch of people know. So that's. Yeah. that's the thing. But, but that's that's a stone cold fact. And it's the thing that I see. And I see it across all sorts of athletic disciplines, combat sports, endurance, you know, athlete. You know, look at the number of folks that um, are USANA, I call it USANA athletes. They are. I mean, I'm amazed by the athleticism and stamina of the ballet. I mean, I look at those sorts of things. So I like go, oh, my goodness gracious, you know, just think everything going on behind that. And gymnasts and and heck, you know, gold medal at bobsledders and, you know, everything else you can think of in between, you know, downhill yeah. skiers and cross-country skiers. And 
Yeah, uh, and I think you know this, but just to let other folks know, USANA is used by more elite athletes. That means Olympians and professional athletes around the globe than any other brand on the planet, period. Yeah. Because you know what? Their bodies are their business. Yeah. And they get led, they get led that way. So that I mean, that's such a great story though, Tom. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, it's and I was just gonna say. The, the more I was involved with USANA, so Derek Parra, um, Dan Jansen, speed skaters, you know, they were some of the early athletes that were um, sponsored by USANA. I, I became sponsored by USANA. So I, I approached them at one point and asked them about sponsorship because like, obviously I love the product. And so um, they did, I was on, I, I love the fact that I was one of the early sponsored athletes. Yeah, you were, yeah. Talking about hundreds of athletes. I mean, now they've got well, well over a thousand. Um, I mean, it's probably thousands of athletes. I, I would love to know the count. 4,000 athletes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's amazing because you hear their story and, you know, Jason Parker, another speed skater, the, the stories are exactly the same. I thought that I would be an outlier, but when you really think about athletically, what we do to our bodies, I mean, that's a big strain, especially the endurance athletes or mm -hmm. a sport that has, you know, an enduring aspect to it. I, I remember reading that an endurance athlete will breathe 20 to 50 times more oxygen than somebody at rest. And the recovery process extends that further. And during that time, you know, as much as we need oxygen, there's that dark side, which is, you know, it, it, oxygen rusts metal outside that oxidation. The same thing happens inside our body. That's what Dr. Strand would explain. Um, the same thing happens inside the body where the oxidation uh, causes free radicals to, to form and that's why we need the antioxidants inside our body to fight the oxidation. And uh, once I understood that, that's when I think I, be I became a ritual user of those products day after day after day. Um, but especially as an endurance athlete, you've got just 20 to 50 times more oxygen, which means that the, the free radical count is exponential compared to somebody who's not an endurance athlete or who isn't active at all. Yep. So it's, it's really important. And likewise, I, I don't want to leave anybody out. If you live a very stressful life or if you are exposed to more toxins in the water and the air or in your workplace environment, or if you're just a high stress, high strung person, well, guess what? That means that you're breathing more and you're creating more free radicals as well. So um, there's a lot of different reasons why we need the antioxidant support. Yeah. And you know, the interesting part is, and you look at the scientific crew, I think some are approaching 80 research scientists and clinicians, you know, going through the science each and every day at the, at the home facility of USANA. And they came up with that formulation. They discovered some real key pathways of cell, cell signaling that today, even past the time when you and I first got involved with the upgrade of what they call now cell essentials, they're able to trigger the antioxidant protection system that's internal to us, the endogenous systems. Yeah. And things like glutathione to come on full blast, you know, when it's yeah. when it's necessary to go. It has huge ramifications. If anybody who's on here wants to ask Tom a question, by the way, because we're not going to keep him too much longer, maybe seven or eight minutes. If you've got anything that you'd like to ask him, just type it in the comments and we'll get it up there for him. But Tom, uh, you know, as, as you go on, I don't know if you're working with, with any athletes outside of the college scenario. Um, I have a 72 year old. Oh yeah? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, it's uh, somebody from back in Bloomington and, and lately he's uh, he's been basically just recycling the workouts. But uh, you know, this, this is a person who just very, very routine, very diligent about his day and uh, so for three months at a time, he would have me write uh, quarterly workouts. And I tell you what, after years and years of doing that, I, I struggled to come up with different variations of his, his structure was very much, I'm going to work out for 55 minutes on the front end. I want a 10 minute warm up and a 10 minute cool down. So ultimately I want 35 minutes worth of a workout. And if I ever didn't have the exact minutes, you know, it was a lot of fart like work. So minute on minute off type of work. And if I didn't have it line up exactly right, he would tell me, he's like, well, this workout that you have written for February 8th doesn't work with the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I mean, I have mainly the, the outside customers that I had had were um, through the running store um, more than four years ago. So. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's, 
It's as I always say, it's usually that cohort that comes after university that sometimes we'll look at looking for that edge. And that's where I always say that's sort of where that that you saw the transition starts to take place with them. Yeah. You know, and that's that's just the way it is, right? But as you said, when we're in college, you know what? I, it's probably changed, you know, our I say my diet, I think, was Mountain Dew and Twinkies. And, yeah. And, Sounds you know, about right. <laughs> and, and Sundays, there was a place called Rusty's, and you could get five burgers for a dollar. So it's got wow. bars. High-quality yeah. meat, I'm sure. Yeah, well, that's because the cafeteria was closed down, you know, on Sunday nights. So that's, that's the thing. So. Yeah, it, I think the diet part, uh, the changes that I made there were, were great. I think I grew this passion for nutrition through – my experience with the supplements and with USANA in general. I mean, the, the amount of information, like you mentioned, the scientists on staff, I mean, compare that to the companies where I asked to talk to a scientist and they said, oh, we, we don't have any scientists on staff. I mean, USANA is run by scientists. It was founded by a scientist and an Albert Einstein award-winning scientist. And uh, I mean, it's just, a ma it's amazing to see the research that they do, plus just looking through all of the medical research that does come out, you know, they compare everything, they read everything, they, they're cutting edge as well. Um, it's just amazing. So, yeah, it is. It is. Well, if nobody has any questions, what, what would you like to, how would you like to wrap this up, Dom? What, what advice could you give to, you know, let's call it not, not necessarily the athlete right now. Let's just say Joe Henry citizen, kind of like I am today. That, what is it that you what did that that advice that you that you have through your years of experience, wisdom, and working with both the yeah. youth and and the older folks as well? I, I think the it's it's advice that I need to be following myself right now, uh, just with the routine being all over the place and probably not having a, a good routine for the last few years. Just uh, you know, learning the ropes of a new job. You know, there's always something new that comes up. A job is stressful, or there's there's a lot of hours required. Um, or, you know, change of relationships, or there's things that happen in the family, there's uh, somebody else's needs. I think the, the piece of advice that I think carries the most weight is that you need to just show up for yourself. Uh, sometimes it's just that first step that, that that's all you need in order to finish the, the next 5,000 steps. Um, it, it's the idea of setting aside or setting out your workout gear or your running shoes uh, the night before <clears throat> so that when you wake up, it's the first thing that you do or your walking shoes. Uh, it's the first thing that you do when you wake up. Uh, and sometimes I guess the question is how often are you going to put those shoes on with your clothes, step out the door and take your first step and then turn around. Typically you're not going to turn around. It's taking that first step where you're like, okay, I'm out here. And now all I have to do is take the next step and then the next step. And, and before you know it, you've got your steps in, you've got your workout done, uh, and you've showed up. And typically, everything else seems to fall in place uh, that much easier going going forward from that. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Absolutely brilliant. And folks, be watching this later tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month, maybe even next year. It's just some words to live by even when this is all over. So yes, that's sir. great, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. it was I, fun. I wish you great success with all of this and getting things all straightened out. Cross-country season will be here before you know it. Let's hope it's all together by then. Fingers crossed. And that's right. And I don't know if we'll see you, if we'll have it, if we'll see you in Salt Lake this August. I hope I so. Hope. Yeah, me too. Time will tell. You know, I've been to, I believe, 15 international conventions now in the last 20 years. Wow. Uh, and it, it kills me every time I can't make it, um, but I've been able to make most of them. So, Well, I think it's the, I don't have, I think it's what, the 13th of August this year. Yeah. Yeah. It's the week before we would start practice. So, yeah. Perfect timing. I, it is. <laughs> That's right. All right, Tom. Thank you. Thank Take you very care. much. Bye, right, everybody. Bye-bye.